Democrat study. We'll be starting the presentation in about five minutes, so uh, no need to hurry. Make your way through some materials. Uh, make sure you grab a booklet when you came in. And uh, like I said, we'll be starting the presentation in about five minutes. On the Richmond, we have a cycle track, including Wellington Theater and Cinco Street. It's not the shortest project name, but it's a you're probably here tonight because you've seen a uh, notice in the mail that looks something like this, or maybe you've got uh, a direct uh, mail uh, as a property owner or as a business uh, that looks something like this. Uh, we've got over 300 people registered on our website right now as stakeholders, and I invite you after tonight's event, if you haven't already, to visit our project web page, click on the uh, register as a stakeholder, and uh, provide your details, and that way we can keep you informed and recognize who's involved in the project. Uh, previous to tonight's public event, we had a public meeting, we had a uh, stakeholder meeting where we invited uh, um, everyone on the list to request to participate in a workshop. Uh, at the workshop, we had about 85 participants that represented a, a spectrum and a, a balance of different interests, including uh, quite a few sectors from and different advocacy, advocacy groups, but also uh, a businesses, property owners, uh, about 10 different resident associations, uh, and a, uh, a sample of residents, about 25 residents, uh, as well as quite a few others. And you can see some of the comments that they provided that night on panel 17 behind me. Tonight, we're continuing to collect comments, uh, and we will do so over the next year until 2014, we'll be taking comments beginning to end, main day of the week, 24-7, our email and voicemail is available. Uh, tonight, again, is, uh, is the beginning of the consultation, we haven't made any decisions yet, and uh, having you here and participate um, uh, in person to person and also online it is great to give us some direction as we start off this study and start looking at making some potential decisions. Uh, if you didn't already, um, as you came in, please fill in uh, this form, Public Consultation Event Sign-In Sheet, and give us your email address. If we don't have you on the list already, this is your chance to get on, and every future event we'll make sure to include an invitation to you. Also, if you didn't already, uh, please do pick up um, a copy of the booklet. It's also online already as a PDF, but uh, to have it in hand is nice to read on the way home. If you're not back in. Which most of you are, as I saw from the sheets, uh, the dotting when people are coming in. Uh, most of us tonight uh, are daily cyclists, but not exclusively. Uh, we saw um, there's also a large group that are uh, weekly uh, vehicle drivers or passengers, uh, as well as a handful of uh, uh, taxi users. Uh, not too many, not too many, not much for uh, delivery. Uh, and it seems like pretty much everybody wants. Fancy. I think that's enough for me. Uh, we now have uh, Lucas and Irma that are going to be presenting on the details about the project. I ask you to please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. And we have a microphone here, and uh, we invite you to make any short questions that you think would be of interest to the group. And otherwise, following that QA, we'll be continuing this. Uh, drop-in event where you can speak directly one-on-one -on -one with staff and you can have your comments collected uh, through multiple different mechanisms as you saw on your way in. Design uh, 
for separated assessment facilities in these corridors. Now, I haven't said that, which in that way, uh, we're looking at alternative routes as well on Wellington Street and North South Connections as well on um, Peter and Simcoe. Uh, in terms of uh, study process, uh, this is following, uh, will be satisfying the requirements of the municipal class EA. Uh, so we will be looking at a range of alternatives uh, undertaken. Um, very fairly extensive technical evaluation of the alternatives, uh, looking at traffic, parking, uh, impacts. Obviously, consultation is a big part of the study. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're here today. Uh, we're interested in the feedback on these options. And what's presented here are essentially preliminary um, alternatives and options to introduce you to the study, provide you a chance to visualize some of the possibilities that we're, we're working with provide the feedback on that. Next slide. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of background, um, essentially there's been quite a bit of interest in the Richmond Avenue corridor dating all the way back to uh, the Toronto Bike Plan, which was adopted by Council in 2001. In that plan, there were references to undertaking studies looking at this corridor specifically. Uh, we know that more recently, in 2011, we had Direction to Council to uh, start implementing the network of physically separated uh, white lanes in the downtown core. This study fits into that. We also have, obviously, you're probably aware that we've implemented recently separated white lanes on Sherman Street. We continue to work on Sherman Street as well, the remaining portion of Sherman Street as well. We continue to work. We're currently in the um, planning and design stage for separated cycling facilities on Rutland well, uh, Wellesley Street, Harvard and Hoskins, and as well we're looking at Beverly Street as well uh, as part of that as part of that network. So this this study essentially fits into that um, into that network that we're developing. The other study that's, that's related to this is we have an environmental assessment now being undertaken for an extension of the West Toronto Rail Path, which more or less in the area you see in purple, which is a study that again is going through an environmental assessment process and is going to uh, bring a fairly high order cycling facility in close proximity to, uh, to the study I wrote here as well. Um, and if you want more information on that project as well, there's information at the front desk and in an open house uh, on that tomorrow. So now I just uh, hand over to Norma, who's going to be doing the review. My name is Norma Morris. Uh, I'm an associate at IBI, who is the Northern Consultant Team that is uh, undertaking the study uh, in uh, collaboration with the city team. And so I'm the project manager for IBI Group. Um, and as Lucas has said, we are following the municipal class environmental assessment. So I just wanted to give you a little brief overview of that. There is uh, generally five main phases in that. Uh, Process and we're really very early in the stage. As Luca said, we're in phase one and two, which we're undertaking. We started this spring, we'll work on over the summer. And that's when we look at the problem or opportunity statement. What's the city trying to achieve by undertaking this study? And what are the alternative solutions that we need to evaluate against a long list of uh, criteria? Uh, so we're uh, just rolling out those uh, routes, those corridor options and the bike options for you to look at tonight and get your feedback on. And then over the summer we'll develop those in more detail, uh, roll out a, a detailed evaluation uh, and uh, come back in the fall with a, a preferred a route and preferred type of bike way. In the third phase we go into designs. So we'll also be looking at specific design uh, issues and different design options, how the intersections be treated, how the driveways be treated. Uh, what will we do with uh, traffic signals, things like that. Uh, and then finally, the phase four is to document all of this in the environmental study report, which will be uh, under a 30-day public review period. And so there will be an announcement when that report is available for public review. And finally, the fifth phase in the environmental assessment is implementation. And uh, there is, uh, is budget in the, the city's budget to implement in 2014, should we have something that can be achieved then, or it might be in later years, depending on uh, uh, Council's approval of the actual route option and, uh, and the, um, the cost of construction. Next slide. Uh, so to start with, uh, I think probably many of you are familiar with what a cycle track is. 
Uh, but I just wanted to go over it very briefly. Uh, generally, uh, there's a lot of people use a uh, different terms sometimes for segregated bike lane, separated bike lane, cycle track. It's really uh, more than just a painted line separating these cycles from the travel lane. So there can be a variety of different separators. As you see, the first one, cycle track that Toronto built is on Sherborn uh, from King to Bore, and it's in one direction on each side of the street. Um, next slide. But we can also have a cycle track that is on a uh, bi-directional, meaning that uh, cyclists travel in both directions. These are generally implemented on one-way streets such as Richmond and Adelaide and, uh, and sections of Wellington. And this example is from Vancouver on Dunsmere, which they implemented uh, a couple years ago. So uh, we have a bi-directional and unidirectional cycle tracks. And next slide, uh, this is an example from Washington, D.C. We also have a variety of separators, so we can have uh, flexible posts, we can have bowlers, uh, with a painted buffer, we can have uh, planters, uh, we can have uh, the rolled curb uh, or the raised curb like you see on Shroburn. And so we'll be looking at a variety of different types of separators uh, for this cycle track uh, along with the preferred group uh, in the fall. Next slide. Uh, so one of the very important elements of the environmental assessment, the class environmental assessment, is defining the opportunity statement. And really, simply put, for this study, what the city is trying to achieve is wide cycle tracks on these corridors. Uh, so uh, we're really looking at your uh, feedback on that particular statement, but we have relied on a number of background studies that have taken place over more than a decade to uh, answer that question, why cycle tracks on these corridors. Next slide. First of all, uh, it was first stated in the 2001 bike plan uh, that the city wanted to look at more innovative design and they specifically referenced Montreal examples of cycle tracks. This one actually predates or post-dates 2001, uh, but there were other examples in Montreal at the time. Uh, and uh, so then carrying on from 2001, next slide, we, we uh, think about what cyclists' uh, perceptions are of what uh, they would like to ride their bicycles in, what makes them feel comfortable and safe. And so there's a cycling study, a tracking report from 1999 and 2009, surveys of residents of Toronto, and it, it, it looks at what people's preferences are. And it said, safety on roads remains the public's principal concern about cycling. Cyclists and non-cyclists agree that having more bike lanes on streets and separating those bike lanes from car traffic would have the greatest impact on improving cycling in the city. Next slide. So, uh, one other thing when we think about why cycle tracks, why are we looking at cycle tracks in the study, is when we think about how bike lanes we know, uh, even just looking at the fact that we have a bicycle lane bylaw that, uh, that clearly states that blocking the bike lane with your car or endangered cyclists by forcing them suddenly to merge with motorized traffic indicates that the conventional striped bike lane does have some problems in the congested city. And so we want to have a cycle track really to try to prevent uh, people from parking and stopping illegally in the bike lane. Next slide. And uh, we're not really looking at sheriffs uh, for these corridors. They would can work very well in, uh, in some of our downtown streets, but like Richmond and Adelaide uh, really have high uh, traffic speeds and, and uh, very high volumes. And so we really want to have separate space, not shared space uh, on those corridors. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at uh, cyclist collisions uh, in the city, and they also point to the need for uh, separated bikeways or cycle tracks. Uh, we know that 21% of uh, collisions involved uh, involving cyclists in 2001, which was reported in a, a collisions uh, a summary that the city produced, that 21% uh, of them are the cyclists and the driver are traveling in the same direction. It's either a side swipe or rear end. And then 12% of cyclists being struck by a car door opening. So that uh, leads us to trying to reduce those types of incidents by creating more space between the travel lane and, and the cyclist. Next slide. And then uh, finally, we look at the council's direction on upgrading downtown bicycle lanes. Uh, as uh, Lucas had pointed out, there is a plan uh, 
to upgrade uh, uh, other bike lanes within the downtown. So uh, 2009, someone study found that people wanted to cycle more in Toronto, uh, but they didn't feel safe doing so. And so the, this downtown uh, bike lane upgrades is intended to try to increase that comfort and safety because there's many people who do want to ride in, in the downtown. Uh, next slide. So let's move away from why cycle traps and ask the question why these corridors. Uh, and again, I'm relying on a number of studies that have uh, taken place in the past. And of course, uh, the, the uh, 2001 bike plan shifting gears. This is an excerpt from the, the proposed uh, bike ways in that study. Clearly shows Richmond and Adelaide uh, as potential bike lanes. Uh, and uh, that was uh, an approved study by Slide. I'll refer again to the downtown cycle track projects. Again, I dropped it by council in 2011. That reinforces the need to look at at least what's for protecting uh, bathrooms for the children. Next slide. And then finally, if we look at the intensity of development, if we look at the um, uh, developments and programs in the downtown, if we look at the existing cultural and entertainment districts. Uh, and employment and residential destinations in the downtown, uh, we really see a need for an east-west bike to, to serve cyclists in this part of, uh, of the city. Next slide. Uh, and staying with the wide east corridors, people will ask, oh, why not King and Queen? Why not John Street? Uh, so we're looking at Peter and Simcoe. Well, King and Queen are even other, uh, I guess, uh, needs in terms of serving uh, the streetcars. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, motorists and cyclists and pedestrians, so it's quite a constrained corridor. So, so to try to take away a lane in order to provide a segregated or, or a separate cycle track, which we really see as the need, would be very difficult on those corridors. Whereas Richmond and Adelaide uh, are the best candidates for trying to find space for cycle tracks. And John Street already has an improved design. It's a sh more of a shared space uh, type of design that allows uh, the street to become more uh, open for pedestrian use during events. Um, and it will encourage people to uh, to ride their bikes in a, a more of a slower, calmer traffic environment. Uh, so really, we're focusing on Richmond, Canada, and Wellington, uh, and uh, Simcoe and Peter. Next slide. Oh, so again, looking at these corridors, we do have traffic, uh, we do have bicycle count information for these corridors from the 2010 report. And if we look at the uh, volume of uh, cyclists that are coming into and out of downtown, uh, an estimate over a 24 hour period uh, shows that we have almost 6,000 coming in on Wellington, King, Avenue, Richmond, and Queen. Uh, we have another almost 3,000 using the front to the queen to the east, and we have about 900 coming in on lower Simcoe and York. So there is a volume of cycles that we're using it now. There's more cycles that are on uh, streets that already have bike lanes, such as college. Uh, so, but we see that uh, I mean, people are, are choosing routes that are more, um, already have bike lanes, but there's still already a demand on these streets, and they're not, don't even have any improvements for cycles. So there's a need to, to service those cycles and other ones who are not there now who, who wish to get to the downtown by bicycle. Uh, so with the uh, why cycle tracks on these corridors, I think we're really looking at cycling downtown it has many benefits, not just to cyclists, but to other travelers by, by reducing the demand on some of our other uh, transportation systems. The, the downtown corridor really needs uh, some bike ways. That's been identified for a long time since the uh, 2000 one by plan. You know that the statistics show that we need to make cycling safer and more comfortable by segregating cyclists from traffic. Uh, and I mentioned in LA and Wellington are some of the best East West candidates because we already have a uh, high competition for space on King and Queen. And Peter and Sipro are probably the best more slow candidates to connect their way to the long So that's our opportunity statement. It seems very long, uh, but I think it's important for us to understand the basic Goal of why, why cycle tracks on these corridors. So the next two slides really are to present the corridor alternatives. And we're really looking for your ideas on, on what you uh, think are um, important about these different alternatives, uh, what uh, 
our positives about them, our negatives, or our enhancements that we could do to make these corridors better and, and other issues. So the first one, uh, these are very basic alternatives that we will look at uh, uh, combinations of them over the summer. But the first one is looking at Richmond and Adelaide as one way. Uh, streets with unidirectional cycle tracks on both of them. So we would have a uh, cycle track with traffic uh, westbound on Richmond, and we would have a cycle track on Adelaide eastbound uh, uh, on Adelaide. So which side of the street it goes on, there's merits in the left side, right side, and so we would be looking at uh, the merits of those uh, different sides over the summer also. We haven't made a decision on that, but we're really uh, looking at alternative A is affecting both streets with these unidirectional cycle tracks. Alternative B is looking at Richmond only. So we would have a bi directional uh, cycle track on one side of the street. We show on the cross sections that it would be on the left side, but it could very well be on the right side. Again, we'll be looking at uh, the trade offs between left side and right side over the summer. Uh, so we would take out a full travel lane on Richmond, just as the previous alternative would take out a travel lane on both Richmond and Adelaide. This would require one travel lane on, on Richmond. So the, the bike way would be wider to have uh, cyclists in both directions. Uh, the second way would be a, a narrower one in this option. Alternative C is very similar to the last one, and that is Adelaide instead of Richmond. Uh, having a bi-directional uh, bike way or cycle track on one side of the street. Again, it could be on the left or the right. And then the final combination is looking at going and how does it fit into the picture. So if you have a bi-directional cycle track on it in combination with Adelaide's, then you could connect bathers to sugar, and that's our goal in the study is to connect bathers to sugar and these steps through the downtown. So if you have a bi-directional cycle track in combination with Adelaide, being in closer proximity, uh, or it could have unidirectional uh, bikeways on, on line 10 and it could be paired up then with both the uh, Adelaide and Richmond uh, to connect over to Sherwood. So this is really a couple of different alternatives uh, shown on here, uh, but we're really just trying to get your input on what do you think of long term as part of the picture. The bikeway options, as I said before, are looking at unidirectional cycle tracks. And uh, this is just a sketch out of uh, what it might look like, a photo of taking out on Richmond Street. Uh, so uh, you can see that the buffer is quite wide and it's unidirectional because we're taking up a, a travel lane and we have room for the cyclists and room for a little wider separator. And uh, these are just some examples of what that separator might be. Uh, we'll be looking at a variety of different kinds of separators over, time, over the uh, fall. Uh, the bi-directional bike lane. Uh, the separator is a little bit narrower uh, because we have to have room for cyclists to travel in both directions. Uh, it would also affect signals on these one way streets, uh, so we'll be looking at those details once we have a corridor uh, selected. And then this is what it might look like on one of the north south streets, so an example of Peter Street with unidirectional cycle track, basically taking over a lane in each direction with two lanes uh, left over for, for traffic, two way in the center. And then finally, a unidirectional bike lane. Uh, we're also looking at bike lanes uh, on the north south connectors, uh, so you would have a bike lane on each side of three lanes, maybe a parking lane, maybe a turn lane, uh, but uh, room for uh, three traffic. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, Jason had talked about consultation today, so I don't want to go over that in great detail. This is sort of the breakdown of uh, the people who came to the workshop uh, on June 13. We had a, quite a, a, a cross section of different people representative, and, and uh, he went over that in greater detail. I mean, some of the things we heard from them alternatively using Richmond and Adelaide was felt to be more intuitive, but it affects two streets instead of just one. Alternative B was closer to Queen Street, that was using uh, Richmond, uh, whereas alternative C was, put, was uh, uh, served uh, sort of the middle of the study area, perhaps a little bit better, uh, but there were more delivery trucks and driveways. Uh, we heard from people about Wellington that it was traveling less, but it was confusing, really, because uh, it wasn't just directly one quarter right through from back to just So you can read about those comments on the panel uh, number 17 here. <laughs> uh, and uh, in 
terms of consultation, uh, we're really looking, as I said, for your feedback on the opportunity staking. Uh, did we define what we're trying to solve? The, the problem that we're trying to solve, did we define it well? Uh, but then we also want to find out what you think about the different corridors. Do you see an advantage in choosing Adelaide or Richmond uh, over Wellington, or, or Wellington in combination with Adelaide or Richmond? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on those alternative corridors? And how do you think the cycle track might affect you? Uh, if you're someone who takes a taxi, how will it affect uh, how you uh, use taxi service? If you use wheel trains, will it, uh, we need to know uh, how the design might affect you so we can try to mitigate any of those uh, impacts on you. So I think that uh, going down to the last couple of slides, we're going to go over the last couple of Jason. We uh, have, um, you can register as a stakeholder. Okay, so again, I just want to remind you that you can register as a stakeholder uh, on the website, and uh, we have a whole bunch of different opportunities here for you to give your comments uh, tonight. Um, I'm going to be opening up the floor shortly for uh, questions, and specifically questions of information. Uh, this is not the, the space for kind of an advocacy platform. We have lots of opportunity for you to give your comments there, but uh, for everyone's benefit, we'd like to focus on questions of information uh, that I think everyone, uh, that many other people might be interested in. Uh, and then we can go back over there, we can have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, you can write your notes on your, what you think about the different alternatives. We definitely really want to hear that tonight. This is the exact point in the study where it can affect where you can make that impact and, and affect the direction the civilians are going uh, by giving us some really useful and insightful feedback on those different alternatives. Uh, beyond tonight, you can also uh, submit comments, of course, online. I'm happy to take a phone call, email, fax. I still get letters in the mail once in a while. Uh, if you want to give me a letter tonight, we have uh, a self address envelope you can just throw it into, and it'll get to me, no need for a stamp. Um, and we're also going to be using these uh, idea radio sheets where you can uh, read someone else's ideas, see if you agree with it or disagree, and also make some comments on it. You just fill in one dot on the scale of agreement and also sign on the right. There's some sheets for ideas, some sheets for questions, so I invite you to take a look at those and see what other people are thinking and, and uh, give us some feedback on and your opinion on other people's ideas. So I think that's it from me. Uh, I invite you now, um, if you've got a question, if you feel like you can project from where you are, go ahead, uh, or please make yourself uh, make your way to the microphone, and uh, ask uh, Lucas and uh, Norma to, uh, to join us up here and actually give some uh, answers to the questions as best we can. And my apologies now, there's probably a lot of things that we can't answer yet, because we don't know, we haven't done the analysis. So you're probably going to end up getting that answer a few times, and I apologize. Uh, because um, we know that traditionally there's a lot of challenges in accommodating um, dedicated cycling facilities on the street corridors because unlike most roadways that don't have street corridors, we can make traffic lane adjustments, shift to traffic lanes, um, make adjustments to the extra cross sections on the street car tracks being present, it limits what the, the options that are available. And at the same time, there's still a lot of demand for you know, drivers and, and, and cyclists and, and, and all the other competing uses of the street. Having said that, there's nothing in this study that would preclude um, the city looking at those corridors in the future. I mean, we've looked at, uh, we've looked at making cycling enhancements on college street in sections where we don't have space for bike lane to put on rush hour shows. So yes, it's not as much as a, as a, as a dedicated cycling facility, uh, but we are looking at the activities where we can, uh, and there's nothing, again, there's nothing in this study that precludes us from looking beyond the core, be, beyond the study area in the future. Um, the comment was made about, you know, building a network of separate facilities and integrating more and more connections. Um, what we see here is the start of a network, I mean, we're looking at developing a, a grid, uh, and like other aspects of the bike plan, it will, it will grow and, and evolve, and new connections will be, will be added to it uh, as time progresses. This study itself obviously has a, has a finite, finite scope and a finite area. Awesome, because I also wanted to say it's just a great study. These two roads are similar. They should be in a study together. That's great. I mean, as a 
Uh, you're saying you don't know, like, really great truck driver, but I have confused both these streets as a moving truck driver. So it kind of counts. You have a big box vehicle. It's, it's just impossible trying to, yeah, I mean, the, the loss of that one lane in terms of, you know, potential slowdowns or convenience, passing convenience, whatever it is, it's just nothing compared to like just not having to deal with that stress of trying to share this lane that's wide enough for a motor vehicle or a bike between two of them and being, you know, pressured by other drivers to do so. And so, I mean, yeah, for me it's just like this would make these roads available and, you know, and safe instead of like, yeah, right now when I ride on this, it's half walking. so far uh, and uh, invitations in the future to uh, future public events. The next big one is probably going to be uh, in the fall. We've got an exact date yet. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.